All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Scarborough here, Consolidated Planning Group. We are a holistic special needs planning firm. If you have joined us in the past for a webinar, we put um, webinars out for special needs families uh, on a weekly basis, and we have a YouTube channel. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but if you're joining us for the first time, we're glad you're here. If you're um, back again with us, we're glad you're back. And um, we are super excited today uh, to have Andy Hardwick um, with the Social Security Administration back with us. Um, you may have attended one of his events in the past. He um, he does a lot of speaking engagements all across the greater Houston area and does a great job. And we had um, we had a, a, a meeting, I, I don't know, I guess it was about a month ago, uh, and we had some technical difficulties that we have improved upon. We've updated slides and we've got all the accurate and um, updated numbers for today. Um, so um, Andy Hardwick, if you don't know, he's a legend in the greater Houston area and we're excited to have him here with us. And today what we're talking about is working while getting SSI or SSDI. Uh, he's going to go deep and wide on that topic um, for us today. And so um, basically um, a little housekeeping items, what you need to know is that your cameras and your um, your audio is muted, so we can't see you and we can't hear you, but we do know you're there. Um, we do want to answer as many questions um, as as we can during this presentation. This presentation will be over by one o'clock, so if you're planning your lunch hour or whatever else you've um, whatever else you've got going on. Today's presentation is also being recorded. And so anybody that registered for this webinar will get an email either later today or tomorrow with uh, the recording. And we'll also send a PDF of Andy's slides so you can have those as a reference as well. So having said that, Andy, I am going to turn it over to you and uh, let you get started. Thanks for, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Allison. Thank you for having me today. And thanks, parents, for coming in here and caregivers. I hope that the information will be useful for you. You know, a lot of parents have concerns and caregivers have concerns about uh, young people who, who start working. I know in school they have the transition program to try to get the young people to get work to, to get their feet wet and get experience and things like that. But I know the concern for parents is that if their children receive SSI or SSDI, uh, is this going to result in a cutoff of their benefits and more importantly, Medicaid and things like that? And my answer to that is not necessarily, not, not really in, I'd say in almost all cases, uh, Social Security wants uh, your young person that you're caring for to get uh, work experience. The, of course, the goal of the work incentive program is to make uh, or get the young people as independent as possible, possibly to a point where they don't have to depend on government programs and they can just be salaried and, and receive all the benefits that a person without disabilities would have. And I know that's not possible in all cases, but, uh, and even if it's not, I will tell you that these work incentive program will provide a means of your young person getting some extra income. So that will help uh, foster some independence there. It'll give them more money, more income, and they'll be able to do more things. So just listen up. It, it's very, it's complicated. There are a lot of rules and things like that. I wish I could say, well, I'm gonna make this simple and just, you know, you, you just, it's, but I'm gonna give you some references, some things that you could refer to that will make the process easier. And of course, you are always welcome to send me an email at andy.hardwick at ssa.gov. If you have further questions, I'll be happy to answer any of the questions. Andy, you let's, um, let's get started by just saying one thing, if you're taking notes and one thing that you need to distinguish between the two, um, and we see a lot of um, confusion of, of families, there is a difference about earning money while getting SSI and, and then earning money while getting SSDI or RSDI. There's a couple of differences going on. So just understand that the SSI and SSDI are not interchangeable. They're two different, they're two different programs. So just, um, and he's going to talk about that, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows that because sometimes people say social security and they're really talking about SSI. So I just wanted to kind of, um, just kind of mention that. And then you can um, continue on uh, to the next slide. We'll, we'll catch up at the end on the other stuff. 
Thanks, Allison. You're absolutely correct. Uh, I have parents tell me all the time when my child gets social security and I, I ask them, has, does your, has your child worked? No. Uh, are you or your spouse getting social security? No. Uh, well, then your child is not getting social security unless your child has a work history and has accumulated enough work credits or one of your child's parents is either deceased and had enough work credits prior to his or her decease or is getting social security disability or retirement benefits, your child is not getting social security. What they're getting is SSI, supplemental security income. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So these work incentive programs, as I said to you uh, at the beginning of the slide presentation, they're designed to promote independence. They can protect eligibility for cash benefits until the goal is achieved. And as I said, some people will come off the program and others will stay on, but that's okay. And these programs are available for SSI and SSDI beneficiaries. So let's talk about SSI and SSDI. Um, like apples and oranges, both are fruits, right? But one is a citrus and one is not. One grows in hotter climates, one grows in cooler climates generally, okay? So just like, even though they're both fruits, they are different. It's like that with SSI and SSDI. So let's talk about SSI, supplemental security income, not social security income. SSI, supplemental security income, is a federal assistance program with no work history required in most cases. If a person is a US citizen, they don't have to have worked in the United States, okay? SSI does not come from the social security trust fund. Income and resources are counted in SSI. So with the SSI program, there's a lot of questions about bank accounts and property ownership and what someone's paying toward the household expenses if they're, a, if they're, they're at least 18 years old and things like that, where we don't ask those kind of questions with Social Security. Now, SSI provides Medicaid, and you cannot receive SSI outside the United States. Social Security can be received outside of the United States because it is a pension program, but SSI cannot. If a person is receiving SSI and they leave the United States for over 30 days, their SSI and Medicaid are suspended until they are back in the US for 30 days. That's not the case with Social Security. The SSI check comes on the first of the month, okay? The Social Security check comes on a Wednesday most often, second, third, or fourth Wednesday, okay? The Medicaid that you get through SSI cannot be used in another state unless the person with the Medicaid is there on a visit, all right? If a person moves to another state, they or their caregiver must notify Social Security the month of move so that we can contact the Medicaid office and they can receive a Medicaid card for the following month. Okay, so if a child with disabilities moves to California for December, they can still use the Texas Medicaid. But starting January, if they don't have Medi-Cal, Med Texas Medicaid is not going to cover the expenses if the person has moved to, to California in the month of December. So what the care per caregiver person has to do or parent uh, is contact Social Security in December so that we can contact the Medicaid office, Medi-Cal in California, and the person can receive the Medi-Cal card for the following month, which would be in January, okay? Now, with the SSI, if the young person is under 18 and living with the parents or step-parents, the parents' income and resources or assets are counted, or part of them are, as though they were the child's, okay? This happens until the child turns 18. Now, once the child turns 18, everything changes. We don't care what mom and dad have. Even though the child may still live in the home, still be dependent on mom and dad, those are not a factor with SSI. Now, the minimum SSI amount is 794 in Texas for 2021. Starting next year will be 800, I'm sorry, the maximum, I said minimum. I, I, Pardon me. I mean, the maximum is $841 for 
for 2022. If there is no other income, then, then the person receiving SSI can get up to $841 from SSI. So Andy, um, sometimes, go back on that one if you could, just a second. Um, I know that we talk to people on a pretty regular basis that um, that are getting a lower amount than, right? So 2021, 794 a month. And that's basically because they haven't submitted a rent or a fair share agreement. So right. not to get off on a tangent, but if you're getting a lower amount right now than seven ninety four a month and you're not working, then you probably need to submit a rent or a fair share agreement to get that um, increased. We can help you with that. But I just want to mention that. And then also this increase for 2022, this is like the largest increase in 40 years. It's like 5.9%. So it's going up from 794 to 841 a month. So that that's a big deal. And it doesn't really usually happen like that, right? You're right. Usually the increase is about $10 or so. Um, as when a child turns 18, because we no longer count mom and dad's income, the way they get paid, we determine the SSI amount is by something called living arrangements. Um, and there's basically two living in a household of another person or living in your own household. Living in your own household means you're living by yourself or you have rental liability, or you own the home, or you live with others and you pay your fair share of the expenses, meaning. If you're in a five-person household, you pay one-fifth of the mortgage or rent, utilities, and food. Six-person, one-sixth, two-people, household, one-half, okay? Um, or if you can't pay your fair share, if you have a rental agreement, a kind of a room and board setup, if you're paying a decent amount for room and board, uh, then we can make you, even though you may not be paying your share of the expenses, uh, if you if this is a a, a, a commercial like arrangement, business like arrangement, where it's for room and board, then we can make it as though you the you were living by yourself, and then you could be entitled to the eight hundred forty one dollars as of next year. Okay. And I just wanted we had something in the chat box I wanted to just chat about for a second. So um, again, um, SSI is a means based program. So if your child is a minor, it's based off of mom and dad's assets. And so can you just confirm those magic numbers um, of of 3000 if you're married 2000? Can yes. you just confirm yes. all of that again, please? Yes. Uh, the, the child themselves, they are, their resource or asset limit is $2,000. If there's two parents in the household, $4,000 for the parents, okay? If there's one parent in the household, $2,000 for one parent, in addition to the $2,000 restriction that the child has. Now, what counts as resource is a second car, the car of lesser value, uh, a second house, if they're, if they're so if, if the person lives in a house, we don't care what the value of the house is. If the person is under 18 and the parents have a, a Tesla, we really don't care if that's the only car. If they have two cars, the car of greater value is not counted, but the one of lesser value counts as a resource toward the parent resource limit, okay? Now, um, all right, so that's, that's for the SSI, not for the SSDI. So talking about SSDI, the Social Security Disability Program, that stands for Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, okay? That's a pension program. Somebody has to have earned it, either the child or young person through work activity or the parent, one of the parents of the young person, okay? Who has either passed away or getting Social Security, all right? Now- I, I just have a quick question, um, jumping back to SSI. In the, in the example, that a parent, because we see this a lot, that a parent has guardianship of their adult disabled child. When they apply for SSI, is the income like the means-based test based off of the parents again, since they have guardianship, or is it still based off of their, their disabled adult child? It's still based on the age of the child. <clears throat> if, the, if the child is 18 or over, no matter what the parents have, it, we don't care. So if they're the guardian or whatever, we don't care. We're, we're no longer counting anything of the parent uh, as far as assets or, or income goes. The child is now treated or the young person is now treated as an adult. 
So we're only taking into consideration what assets or resources they have, what income or resource, uh, what income they have. Okay. So this is why the way they get, the way we determine the SSI amount is by their living arrangement. Are they paying their fair share or are they there as room and as a, as a boarder receiving room and board, or are they in the house and maybe what they pay uh, toward the household expenses is not their fair share and it's not a room and board situation. Well, then in that case, they get the lower amount of SSI, which is about 520 something dollars a month, as opposed to living in their own household or in a room and board arrangement where they would get the $841 per month. Okay. So um, if a parent passes away, their child who's under 18 gets social security by virtue of being a minor. No disability needs to be proved. So we're not taking any disability uh, applications or anything if the child is under 18. We are just entitling that child because that a parent who died and had enough work credits or have a parent or they have a parent who is alive and getting either social security disability or social security retirement benefits. Okay, so just by virtue of being 18. But now at 18, we're ready to cut the child off because that is a cutoff point. Unless they're in, they're in school, then we can extend the benefits until age 19. But then that's it. That's it. No further, unless the child has a disability. So if the child has a disability, disability, the parent contacts us, the, child, the parent fills out the disability form. And if that's approved, the child is now classified as disabled adult child, disabled adult child, DAC, D-A-C. Now that child, that young person can continue receiving benefits under social security, under their parent, okay, as a disabled adult child. And after two years, they receive Medicare, okay, just like a senior, Medicare, because anybody who's on SSDI, the Social Security Disability Insurance Program, they receive Medicare after two years. Okay. So I want to take a pause on this um, and just for some clarifying moments. So the bottom line is, is if, you're, if your disability started prior to age 22, or if your child's disability started prior to age 22, then they have the ability to ability to be considered for um, childhood disability benefits. I guess that's what they call it now, but they've always called it disabled adult child. Um, so, so, and, and the reason this is so cool and so important is, is because if we have a loved one with a disability that won't ever work, then, then essentially if this benefit wasn't available um, to be a disabled adult child under a parent's record, they would never, ever qualify for social security. So this is basically allowing all the work quarters that you've put in and allowing your child to kind of cling under there because otherwise they they wouldn't qualify for disability benefits. So so this is really cool and I just um for anybody that has applied again for their child for SSI and the child's disability started prior to age 22. This is just an important conversation and I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. So thank you Andy for that. Yes. So even if, the, even, a, even if the person is now 30 years old, if they are single, unable to work, and one of their parents passes away or is getting social security, either disability or retirement, when this person is now 30, as long as they can show that the disability began before age 22, we could entitle this adult under their parent Okay, because they have a disability which began before age 22. All right. Um, and I think you're going to address this later in your slides, but we did have a question from the audience that basically said so when the parent retires and the, the child moves over to SSDI or essentially RSDI. Um, they want to make sure that they don't lose Medicaid. So, so we want you to talk about that. If it's not in these slides, we want you to make talk to us about that. Okay, that's called a pickle amendment. So what happens is uh, you have a child on SSI because maybe none of the parents has passed away and neither parent is receiving social security, but the child is disabled, has the disability, and now they're 18, so we're no longer counting what mom and dad have. 
uh, mom and dad has. So now the child applies for SSI, they get approved. But now a couple of years later, one of the parents either passes away or starts getting social security. Now the child becomes entitled to social security under the parent as a disabled adult child. And maybe the amount of social security is too much for them to continue on SSI, all right? So they get cut off of SSI. Well, are they gonna lose the Medicaid? Not necessarily under the Pickle Amendment. If the only reason the child, and it has to be a child at least 18 years old, was cut off of SSI was because now they became disabled, now they became entitled to disabled adult child benefits or childhood disability benefits, which they're interchangeable. If they now become entitled to social security under their parent because they have a disability which began before they were age 22, okay? And that amount is too much to keep them on SSI. As long as they keep the SSI rules, they can still, they can still keep the Medicaid, okay? They can still keep the Medicaid. And after two years, they will come on Medicare. So they will actually have <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid. They will have so actually, the bottom well, line is, is the pickle amendment is going to allow them to keep Medicaid, but you still have to follow the Medicaid rules. So in that example of a single, your, your child, your adult child, they can't have more than $2,000 assets in their name. And so the money that's coming over from SSDI or RSDI, there may need to be distributions to an ABLE account or to a special needs trust to keep the assets below 2000 Yes, uh, yes, unless they have an ABLE account. In an ABLE account, yeah. you can have up to $100,000 in that uh, under the SSI program, okay? So it, in the example that they're SSDI, so like right off the bat, every month, they're, they're so half of dad's, you know, social security is two, two thousand, just say it's $2,300 a month. So right off the bat, they're getting 2300 so and immediately when they get that 2300 then they need to ha move assets um, to, to have it lower than $2,000 to an ABLE account in order to maintain Medicaid in that example? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because sometimes we have people that their parents' Social Security amounts are pretty high. So that 50% amount, uh, you know, can be right on up there of 2000 or $2,300. So they would just have to well, move that immediately to an ABLE yeah, yeah, or yeah. spend it down. Yes, move it or spend it down or whatever, or, or uh, pay it, pay toward the household expenses, whatever. Pay whatever. for the okay. rent, exactly. Right. Okay, got right. it. Okay, so what happens when a person getting SSDI returns to work? Now, okay, uh, this is this is where things get a little bit. There are rules that apply to SSI and SSDI when a person goes to work. And there are some rules which only apply to SSI, some rules that only apply to SSDI. So work incentives actually apply to, even though we have SSDI here, they actually, well, some of them apply to SSI. So, okay, trial work period, this only applies to SSDI, SSDI. So if you get social security under your parent, Okay, or you get social security because of your own work. Because some of our young people, they accumulate enough work credits where they can actually become eligible for SSDI, their own SSDI. It's not going to be a whole lot, but they're going to get that in addition to the SSI. Okay, so for the SSDI. Uh, so in that example, I want to talk about that because we actually just had a question about that. So, okay. so, so, and we don't see this very often, but you just nailed it. So. Basically, the child can still be considered a, a disabled adult child. They may have worked a little, earning less than the substantial gainful amount, and have benefits under their own record and still qualify. They could actually qualify for SSI, SSDI, and as a disabled adult child, right? You, if well, they're we'll, earning $1 we'll, of SSI. Under social, under social Security, we'll give them the higher. When a person qualifies for two benefits, we give them the higher benefit. Okay. So if they qualify for their own social security and they qualify for social security under a parent, we'll give them whichever one is higher, which is probably going to be the one under the parent. But if it gets to the point where their own social security is, is higher, then they can, then at that point we'll contact them and they can switch. 
they can file an application at that point on their for their own, and then they will be switched over to their own. Or if if the other parent dies or starts getting social security and that's higher, then they can file an application and we will switch them to the other parent because they can get more under the other parent. But in the example of the substantial gainful amount, so basically the social security administration calls a substantial gainful amount uh, 1310 for, for 2021. So if your, if your child is considered a disabled adult child and they go to work, and they ever make more than that substantial gainful amount, will they come off? Will they like move away from being a, a, a disabled adult child? Uh, okay, so they claim that they were disabled before age 22, but now, well, they may have been disabled before age 22, but if the, at the present time they're engaging in SGA, uh, yeah, well, remember, any, anytime you get a disability uh, uh, benefit, either SSI or SSDI, those cases are reviewed every three, five, or seven years. But under the SSDI program, if they are working, that could trigger a review where where DDS, who makes the disability decision, they could look at the, they could say, well, we're going to do a uh, a continuing disability review on this case because it looks like this person is earning substantial amounts of money. So their disability, even though they may have the disability, if they can earn a, a X amount of money, we're no longer going to consider them disabled. So uh, they wouldn't have to worry if they got benefits in the past or get got benefit got approved because their benefit their disability began before age 22 that's fine that's not going to change but if now their their work gets to a certain level uh, they may be cut off okay but there are you know under the SSDI program we have a 9 month trial work period not for SSI SSDI so if they're getting social security because of their own work or because of under a parent and they're getting the SSDI benefit, they have nine months and they don't have to be consecutive in which they can earn almost any amount of money and not be cut off at all. So actually for next year, the amount is 970. So anytime they earn over 970 gross for the month, they're using up one of their nine month trial work periods, okay? And if they get, if at the end of the nine months for next year, they earn, let's say they use up their nine months, okay? Uh, now, let's say the 10th month, now they're earning uh, $1,360. Well, the, the cutoff is $1,350, what we call substantial gainful activity. For next year, it's $1,350. So if, if the 10th month, they earn $1,350, $5, $13.55, $5 over, we're going to consider that as they're engaging in substantial work activity, and then their checks stop. But if within a certain period of time they stop, we can start those checks back up again. This is how it works for SSDI, okay? So look, I don't I don't blame anybody if if it sounds like I'm talking Chinese, but I'm going to or Greek or whatever. But I'm going to I'm going to give you a resource later where you can look this up. And remember, you can always contact us, and uh, we will explain. It's 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 not that easy. It, it's a little bit uh, convoluted there. But but remember, this trial work period only applies to people who are getting Social Security, not the SSI. Okay, so uh, once a person has used up their trial work period, the person enters into what's called the extended period of eligibility. That's the next 36 months. So once they use up the nine months, okay, they have the next 36 months is the extended period of eligibility. If any time during that time, okay, they're earning under $1,350 a month starting next year. They can still get their social security, their full social security check. The SSDI is not going to be cut. Okay. But of course, if they're earning like $1,300 a month, 
uh, like I said, DDS Disability Determination Services may look at this and say, hey, you know, if they can earn this amount, maybe they're progressed to such a point that they don't need SSDI anymore because look at the amounts they're, they're earning. So, but theoretically, if they've used up their nine months for the next three years, if as long as their earnings stay under 1350 gross, then they can still stay on the SSDI program. Okay. And okay, if if um, after the 36 months are up, if they uh, if they their earnings were too high and we stopped their checks with any time within five years, we can after the 36 month extended period of eligibility is over. If within five years they get worse and they go under that 1350 amount and they're still disabled, hey, they can say, please expedite my uh, please expedite my reinstatement and we will do that. And DDS will look, disability determination services will look at that case and see if, hey, I, we know they were working and earning substantial money, but now it looks like their disability has gotten worse and they're earning less than $1,350. We'll keep them on. Okay. So what if an employer pays an SSDI beneficiary a higher salary than what his or services are worth? And the higher salary causes the beneficiary to go over the SGA limit. All right, so let's say that your child is working in a warehouse. The warehouse is owned by a neighbor of yours. The, 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 where, the warehouse guy, your neighbor, likes to employ young people, and the basic pay that he gives them is $1,500 a month. Now, maybe your child can't produce as much as the other people working there, the other workers, uh, because of their disability, okay? Because of his or her disability. So even though maybe your child, the, the worth of what your child earns is $1,000, but because your neighbor knows you and, and you know wants your child to work and succeed, he's paying him or her the same amount as he's paying the other young people, even though maybe what your child is doing is not really worth 1,500, maybe it's worth 1,000. Well, if you come to us and you tell us that, we will contact the employer, and if he says, well, I, I'm paying them 1500 this young person, but really the work is worth $1,000, well, then that's a big deal because now they're under that 1350 limit because even though they're getting 1500 the 500 is considered a subsidy. That's something above and beyond what they actually earn, so we're not going to count that, so that could make a difference in your child continuing on the SSDI program or being cut off after a certain time, okay? And that, by the way, that subsidy works for SSI also. So now with SSI, uh, we count most of the income, okay? Except if it's a subsidy, again, that the portion of the pay that's a subsidy wouldn't be counted, all right? What can about, we talk about um, can we talk about that substantial gainful amount and what's counted like the the earned income and the unearned income? Um, so someone said, what does that thirteen ten consist of? So wages, basically, wages, wages, earnings, earnings okay. from work. That's it. Okay, earnings from work. Unless you're getting royalties, if your child is a singer or something, and they're getting paid royalties for their song being played on the radio station. That's salary. Royalties are considered salary. Anything that's considered salary, in other words, earnings from work. So when we're talking about 1350, we're talking about work income, not pensions, uh, dividends, interest, other income coming in. We're talking about income from work. The person that's getting SSDI is working, okay? Or the person getting SSI is working. That's what we're talking about not any kind of pensions or any other kind of income. Is that um, making we have, clear? Um, yes, that's good. And, and we actually get that question almost every single week. Um, so we actually have another question and this one actually comes up pretty regularly too. 
Um, if a child was already getting SSI, say they were living in a group home prior to turning 18, mm -hmm. now that, that the child turns 18, do they need to reapply for SSI? Or what happens if they were okay. getting it before, what happens when they oh, turn 18? Okay. okay. At 18, uh, people who are getting SSI before they turned 18 get a medical redetermination. That means, okay, before you're 18, you're determined to be disabled based on child standards, meaning you're compared to other children of similar age to see if the, you can feed yourself, dress yourself, use the bathroom, respond to commands. At 18, though, the child is considered an adult regardless of their mental status, okay? They, they may not have the, the mental uh, status of an 18-year-old, but still at 18, now they're considered an adult. So now Disability Determination Services, DDS, is looking at can they do some kind of work uh, and, and what kind of work can they do and are, can they produce substantial gainful activity. So they're going to be looking, they're going to be judging them by adult standards. So that would, so if you go to, if you put in Social Security Blue Book under Google, in Google, you just put Social Security Blue Book, you will see the manual that DDS uses. It's divided into two sections. A is for adults, people 18 and older, and B is for people under 18 years old. So that's what they're going to be using, the standards. They're going to switch from the standards in B to the standards in A in that Blue Book. Okay? So if you, again, if you type in under Google, Social Security Blue Book, the formal name is Disability Evaluation under Social Security. You're going to see the manual that is used to determine whether or not the person is disabled. So everyone who's on SSI before age 18, at age 18 or somewhere within a year of turning 18, they're going to get a letter saying that their case is going to be reviewed medically. So it's going to ask for names of doctors, hospitals, clinics, and all that kind of good stuff. And to see if now they meet the disability standards as an adult. Okay. All right. So, so we talked about subsidy. We also have something called impairment related work expenses. And they actually, these apply to both programs too. SSI and SSDI. What does that mean? That means these are certain expenses that a person has in order to be able to work. In other words, if the person didn't spend their money on these devices or services or whatever, they wouldn't be able to do the work. So whatever is spent for impairment related work expenses is not that amount is subtracted from their gross wages, meaning we're not going to count that portion of the wage way of their wages that they have to spend for that device or that service or that medication in order to get to work. Okay. Now, with the with the SSDI program, okay, uh, there may be some point where they're earning enough money where they're going to be completely cut off from SSDI but they can still stay on. Remember, if they're on SSDI after 24 months, they come on Medicare, okay? They can still continue to be on Medicare for seven years and nine months, even though they're no longer getting SSDI because their earnings are too high, okay? So we wanna protect them as long as possible. And then presumably within the seven years or after the seven years and nine months, they will have health insurance through their employer. So they, they won't have to worry about Medicare till they get old enough, 65, to get on Medicare. Okay. All right. So Can let's you, talk. Can um, you just chat? I just want you to clarify just for a second. Um, I know that Medicaid is typically the last payer. If a person has private insurance right. and Medicaid, it's the last payer. But when they switch over and after two years, they become eligible for Medicare. So then they have Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance. Can you confirm the, the order? I know Medicaid remains last, but is their primary insurance first and then Medicare? Or is Medicare first and then their well, primary I, insurance? I know if a person is working, uh, I know for older people, when they come uh, while they're working, Medicare is secondary, and once they stop, Medicare becomes primary. So you can the parent can check with the insurance company, but uh, usually 
Medicare is primary and Medicaid is the last payer of all. So you may know and that better been, than I. That, that's been my experience that it was um, that went. So always Medicaid last. If it's just yes. SSI and you have yes. private insurance, your private insurance is first and the Medicaid. But my experience has been that it's um, when they switch over to RSDI or SSDI and they're all, they have all three, that it goes Medicare, Medicare private, private insurance, insurance, and then and Medicaid. Medicaid. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what if a person on SSI goes to work? Okay. They don't get that nine month trial work period or anything like that. Well, generally the rules for SSI are if a person works and is getting SSI, we take the gross wages and um, we subtract, if they have no other income other than the SSI and their gross wages, we subtract $85 from their gross wages for the month and then divide the remainder in half. And that's what we count. Okay. So uh, let me give you an example here. Oops. And I should have updated this because this is 794, but this is using for 2021. So let's say a person is, is working and they're earning $500 a month gross. Okay. And their other, the only other income was 794. Before they started working, they were getting 794, which is the top SSI amount in 2021. All right. So they had no other income except that work income and the SSI. So we subtract $85 from 500. Okay. So that gives us, oh, wait a minute. These amounts don't show up here. Okay. There it goes. So that gives us $415. All right. We take the 415 and we divide that by two. Okay. That results. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing, I'm going backwards. I apologize. That results in 20750. That's what we're going to count against the SSI. So if they get, uh, if they get 794, from SSI and they're earning gross $500 a month, we will count $207, less than half of that against their SSI, okay? So that would mean that they would end up getting $586.50 in in, in SSI, okay? All right, and actually we have a provision, you can get, your child can get to a point where they're actually earning about $30,000 a year so they wouldn't be getting any SSI, but they're still on the Medicaid. That's called the 1619B provision. So the 1619B says, if you still need the Medicaid to pay your medical expenses, if whatever insurance you have through your employer, or you have no insurance through your employer, and you need the Medicaid to pay for your expenses, even though your wages get to such a point where your SSI is reduced to zero, As long as you keep the SSI rules, we can keep you on Medicaid, okay? I think the threshold in Texas is about $35,000 or $37,000 a year. But remember, if you get to that amount, that's going to probably trigger a review by DDS to check to see if you're still, you know, pretty, if you're still uh, disabled. And and if, if there's been no improvement in your condition, even though you earned that amount, you'll still stay on the SSI program. Now, let's say that that job, that lucrative job that you have, all of a sudden the company folds up and the next month you have zero. Well, guess what? You start your SSI again because you're technically still on SSI. The only reason you were cut off was because the amount of your earned income. But uh, you're still on the program because we were giving you Medicaid, but now we're sending you a check again because you have zero income. So the SSI is always affected by any other income you may have. So I want to I want to just pause here for a second and kind of talk about this because this is where we start throwing around all these synonymous terms that pe- that aren't synonymous after all. <laughs> um, so when you said a person, so in this example, the thirty five to thirty seven thousand. And because of this provision, the 1619, they can still qualify for Medicaid. But that amount of 35,000 is certainly higher than the substantial gainful amount for 2022 of 1350. So in that example, they would lose their status as a as a childhood disability benefit under a parent's record. Okay. But they would be building it under their own. Stop. We're talking about SSI here. SGA, the substantial gain, still applies 
to SSDI. It does not apply to SSI. Only when you're filing for the only when you're filing. If you're filing and you're earning over thirteen fifty next year, your uh, your claim is automatically denied for SSI or SSDI. But once you get started, SGA that thirteen fifty does not count anymore in the SSI program, only under SSDI. So you were right, Allison. Yes, on the SSDI, they might be cut off under their parent, but not necessarily for the SSI program. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. And so yeah, that's the key it's, it's, is that there's different true. numbers for the different programs. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So see, if your earnings got to 1673 gross, at that point, your SSI would be reduced to zero this year. Okay, so if you got to that level, it'd be, but that's okay. As long as you still showed you needed the Medicaid, that's it. We can keep you on. All right. Now, what if you have a child, or what if you are, if you're the recipient and you're under 22 and you're in school full time? Okay. Uh, if you're in school full time and you're under 22, uh, you can actually earn. $2,040 a month before your SSI starts to be reduced, okay? Up to a total of $8,230 for next year. This year, it's $7,777, an easy number to remember. But starting January, it's gonna be $8,230 for the year. So we can, if your child like is, is working and in school full-time though, under 22 and working, we can exclude up to $2,040 per month until they reach a maximum of $8,230 for the year. And then after that point, we, we apply the regular rules, meaning we subtract 85, whatever is left, we divide by two, and that's what's counted against the SSI. But as long as they're within these limits, we're not counting anything against the SSI, okay? Can we talk about when the, the deduction would be taken? We have something in the chat that says, let's just talk about a person who works and earns 500 and $207 will be subtracted. Which month would that be taken out? Uh, the, way that, the way the SSI works, uh, it's, if it's not going to cut you off, if it's going to cut you off, if, if it's too high for you to get payment, it's going to cut you off. It's counted in the month it's received. Uh, if it's not going to cut you off, but it's going to affect your payment, it's counted two months later. So if they earn the money in June, then it should count in August. Uh, wait a minute. Ju no, Ju I'm sorry, in July. It should count in July. No, I said two months later, right? It counts in the month. I think it's you're right for August because the earnings yeah. in June would be reported um, on July 1st or right. before July 5th. August. And so yes. then August. it would be August. I think you're, yes. that's, that's, I count it the same. Two months later. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's going to affect the payment, it's counted two months later. Yeah. Okay. All right. So impairment related work expenses, uh, which applies for both SSI and SSDI. So as I said, if there are certain expenses that the person with disabilities has, uh, medical devices, residential modifications, medical services, transportation expenses, those can be subtracted from the amount of wage, gross wages that we're going to count. So if a person has earns $1,500 a month, but has $500 in, that, in expenses, in order to be able to work every month, then we're only going to start with a thousand, not with fifteen hundred. Okay. So here's an example. Okay, uh, Pete's only income is SSI plus gross wages of six fifty. Okay, he has impairment related work expenses of two fifty. So here's the six fifty without any impairment related expenses. So 650 gross minus 85 is 565 minus, minus I'm sorry, divided by two is 282.50, okay? That's what we're gonna count against the SSI. So 282.841 minus 282.50 is 558.50. That's what Pete gets if he earns 650 gross and has no expenses related to his 
disability. Okay. Now, in the in the same Pete, earning six fifty, but now he has two hundred fifty dollars a month that in expenses that enable him to go to work. Okay. So we take the six fifty, we subtract the eighty five, that leaves five sixty five. Now we take the five sixty five and we subtract the two fifty that he has in work expenses, okay, impairment later work expense, that leaves 315, that's divided by two, that leaves 15750, that's what we're counting against the 841, that leaves 68350 payable, so you have 55850, the person has no impairment related work expenses, 68350, the person has $250 of work expenses, okay, Let's talk about a pass. All right, let's say we have a young person that has, that initially is on SSDI, okay, under their parent, and you're getting $1,500 a month, okay, under their parent. Uh, they wouldn't be eligible for SSI, all right? But let's say the $1,500, the, the young person that gets $1,500 a month is able to go to college. He or she wants to go to college and they want to be a teacher. It's going to take four years. They go to U of H. They find out to enroll in classes for uh, tuition and fees is going to be approximately $1,500 a month. So they write up a pass. What is a pass? A pass is a plan for achieving self-support. It, it says, my goal is to become a teacher. It's going to take me uh, four years to become a teacher. The $1,500 I get from SSDI, I'm going to use the whole money, the whole amount for tuition and fees. Now this person can turn around, apply for SSI, get Medicaid, and possibly also be eligible for the 841 from SSI because they're going to be using all of their SSDI money to for, for this plan to become a teacher. So therefore, if this is written up, Submit it to SSA and we approve it. We won't count any of that $1,500 a month that they get from SSDI. So they can now apply for SSI and be shown to have $1,500 a month, but which is not countable. And now they can get the maximum amount, possibly qualify for the maximum amount of SSI. So, okay. so far, you've said that there's this past program and then there's the earned income exclusion um deduction where they don't count that if they're under age 22 and a full-time student and then you've talked about the income um, and the, the employment program. related ex the employment related expenses that could also um cause them not to have their benefit reduced okay so this so there's all kinds of different options basically is what you're explaining yes yes there's a lot more option than i went into today this would take uh uh a uh, workshop of several hours, but I will tell you this. Uh, well, let's, let, let's see if, I, I don't think we get to it here. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize if there's no slide for that. It's called the Red Book, okay? Go to socialsecurity.gov or ssa.gov. Just type in the search box, Red Book, Red Book. This will give you a summary of the work incentive programs under SSI, SSDI, and which programs work for both, or which incentives rather work for both programs. So please we'll use that as that a resource. We'll attach that in today's email. We'll, okay. we'll go ahead and right. just attach the Red Book in today's email. And there was right. a slide on here for that. Oh, okay, good. All right. So Bob works uh, part time as a hotel busboy, he's paid $700 a month. He wants to become a pastry chef and writes up a pass and um, he, to attend baking class. Now his baking classes, his baking classes are going to cost $400 a month. So let's, let's, let's look at this. So set his SSI is, uh, his gross wages are $700 a month. We subtract 85, that leaves 615 divided by two, that's 30750. But now, oh, shoot. Okay, there's another slide here. <laughs> okay, I knew something was missing here. Okay, so we have the 30750, but he has a plan for achieving self-support of 400 that he's paying for his schooling. 
That subtracted from the 307.50 is a minus 92.50. That means we're not counting any of his $700 a month that he's making because he's using that for pastry school, okay? And under the plan for achieving self-support, we're not counting anything, all right? So he could get $841 in SSI, even though he's working and making $700 a month. He could get his full SSI under that PASS program. So uh, as was said, there it is, okay? We have, as you see below, the 2021 Red Book is available. Okay, so all you have to do is go to ssa.gov. You could do dot gov slash redbook, or in the search box, just put redbook. Either way, it's going to work. Okay, you're going to get the 2021 edition. So that's going to talk to you about what work incentive programs we have for SSI and SSDI. All right, I'm done. Um, you can advance to go to the okay. next slide, please. Right. Um, so, um, so today, um, this has been recorded and again, um, what we're going to send out to you, we're going to send out a copy of today's slides along with a copy of the social security red book. Um, you will have, um, there will also be a link to the YouTube channel for past webinars that we've talked about that were specifically SSI. Um, you know, we've had other work incentive ones, we've had other SSI ones. Um, it is a lot to take in, it's a lot of information. So if you're um, feeling overwhelmed, you're not alone. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a lot to learn because of the two different programs. And a lot of times our, the, our families are dual, you know, dual qualified. So that is certainly, um, certainly a thing. And as parents, as we're aging and getting older and considering retirement or disability ourselves, then that kind of flips the switch on some of those things. Um, we're running out of time. Um, as always, um, we have, um, we always put a list of things that should be on your radar um, as it relates to planning for special needs, we've got webinars on every single one of these topics. And as Andy said, there's, there's never enough hours in the day to get all of this information in. That's why we put these webinars on, out on a pretty regular basis. So you can go to that YouTube channel and select the one that might be um, most relevant to you and kind of the, the stuff that you're on. And you can go to the next slide. Um, one of the main things that we didn't talk about here and that I do want to mention, I always try to mention this, that it's important. Um, if you have a child that, that you're going to continue to get um, child support for after they turn 18, that child support, I, I believe it's two thirds that can be two counted thirds, against yes, them for, yes. for SSI. SSI. And so this is a snafu and it's a snafu that people run into all the time. That child support, if it's going to continue post age 18, uh, needs to be redirected to a special needs trust. So um, just have that on your radar if that's you and you you fit into that category. It's a big deal. I'd just like to take a moment um, to just say meet my team. Um, oftentimes, uh, I run the webinars for Consolidated Planning Group. I know Michelle does too, but um, I certainly have an awesome team um, that we um, work collaboratively with. So I just wanted to share, share my team. And if you'll go to the next slide, um, we are nationally certified as social security advisors. We're also uh, members of the Special Needs Planning um, Academy. We have a specialized software that really helps um, families determine when and how to pull the trigger on their own social security, on your own retirement, and maximizing benefits that are available to a, maybe a non-working spouse or a disabled child. Um, as well as any benefits that might be um, for a, a child and care benefit that is also eligible um, through the Social Security Administration. So should you be interested in, in kind of going through one of those calculations or you need help with a future care calculation, certainly reach out to us. You can take a picture of that um, QR code on your screen, and that'll take you to a place where you can schedule with us should you want to. We always have free um, personalized consultations. So um, we've got our Facebook, um, our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. Check us out. You can, again, subscribe to that YouTube channel, and then you can have on-demand videos of any of these topics that might be most relevant to you. I've got one o'clock straight up. So Andy, we did good. We finished right on time. And Andy, as always, uh, it's a pleasure having you back with us. And you're always a wealth of information. Um, guys, tune in in January. We have another scheduled webinar with Andy. Um, tune in and tune up because Andy is on a retirement path. And so we, um, we have a limited number of um, 
of uh, of talks with Andy left before before he uh, sunsets his long career with the Social Security Administration. So thank you again, Andy. Thank you, thank everybody. You. I have one Thanks. very last last question. I I did want to ask, um, and I hadn't seen it before. Do you know anything about HIP? Um, let me let me get to it. HIP reimbursement. Um, but it says they used to receive it, but they, um, but when they qualified for Medicare, they don't, um, and have insurance through a primary company, are, are they still eligible for a HIP re- reimbursement? I don't know the answer to that. Do you happen to know that uh, one? They would have to, I would just say call the 1-800-MEDICARE number, which is 24-7, okay? And uh, don't call between 9 and 5 call after five. You can even call on weekends. That's weekends or at nighttime. That's when you get the least competition and just call and they'll be able to give you, uh, they can talk about coverage issues as far as what Medicare covers or not. I don't know if Medicare covers hip replacements or under what circumstance, but uh, they'll be able to tell you. For sure, for sure. And then um, just, um, there was just a, a a message here saying in 20 years of listening to presentations, this was the most helpful one that she had ever heard. So anyway, kudos wow. for that. Thank you very so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. And come come back and join us in January for the next one, next one um, with, with Andy Hardwick. Thanks so much and have a great day. Take care.